Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. As we live our life stories and strive to create our best life story on purpose, we have the opportunity to deal with challenges. And one of these challenges can be trauma. There are many things that cause trauma for us, violence, abuse. We'll get into this more in the interview. And what causes trauma for some will not cause trauma for another. But learning to navigate and to learn from it and doing the work to make sure it doesn't sabotage us and our relationships seems like a pretty important skill set. So today we're going to talk about trauma. Mark Gulston, MD, said, quote, unlike simple stress, trauma changes your view of your life and yourself. It shatters your most basic assumptions about yourself and your world. Life is good. I'm safe. People are kind. I can trust others. The future is likely to be good. And it replaces these with feelings like the world is dangerous. I can't win. I can't trust other people or there's no hope. Unquote. Stay tuned as I talk with Trevor Lay from Little Rock, Arkansas, who has over 18 years of experience in behavioral health care and social services. He specializes in trauma and does trauma trainings for his local DHS offices and foster care support groups in Little Rock. Stay tuned for our conversation about what trauma is, misconceptions about trauma, how it works in the body and how to effectively treat it, and the effect it can have on our relationships, how to navigate. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee. And I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. Lay is the executive director of Full Potential Child Development Center and received his master's degree in social work from the University of Arkansas. Trevor came to my attention after using his skills to help Brittany Wallace. She was a past guest on the Love Your Story podcast. You may remember her. And she highly recommended him, said his skill set was a godsend that helped to salvage her marriage. So Trevor and I have done some talking, and I think we're all going to learn some really helpful things today. So Trevor, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, Let's start with a little of your story. Um, Why do you do the work that you do? It's a great question. You know, probably like for a lot of people, um, several different things kind of coalesced in my life that led me down this path. When I was young, when I was probably, I don't know, maybe nine or 10, I, I learned that my mother was sexually abused as a child. And I saw the impact that that the trauma had on her um, growing up. And uh, it really was a kind of a pivotal part of my life. And then um, when I went to went to college, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. But in between um, classes, I got the opportunity to work with autistic kids and just really love working with kids. It was something that I just I felt really drawn to, felt natural uh, with. And so when I got out, I worked at a counseling clinic locally for a couple of years and decided I was going to go back and be a therapist. And then went and got my master's degree at UALR and um, and just love what I do. And so um, I've, I've had that experience in there with my family. And then when I was in grad school, I also, um, we did genograms where we would look at our family tree and our family history and how life has impacted you know us through our family. And it was a, there was a lot of trauma in my family prior to me. I had a pretty good upbringing, didn't have a lot of traumatic events as a child, um, but then as a teenager, I actually suffered um, a trauma and, and uh, dealt with sexual abuse, uh, not in the course of my family, but from someone outside the family. And so um, just dealing with trauma and learning from trauma has been just a critical part of life. And, I, and I'm real passionate about helping others to, to deal with trauma. Well, I hear good things about your skill set. So let's talk about it. You said that one of your favorite quotes is by Basil van der Kolk, MD. Did I say his name right? Yes. From the book, The Body Keeps Score, quote, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives, unquote. 
tell me what this means to you. Well, I mean, feeling safe and that sense of safety is really the absolute psychological foundation for what we do as we grow and we learn as people. Um, you know, it's like building a house. We, we build everything else on that. And when you don't have that, that safe foundation to, to build from, it leads to a lot of problems. And so um, it's just a critical, critical part of life. Let's explain, let's start with what trauma is. What is it and what types are most prevalent? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of trauma. It's important to note that not all trauma is created equal. And so a lot of times people have a tendency to want to compare, you know, trauma like, hey, I've gone through this or you've gone through that. And, and there's this real tendency to, you know, say, well, maybe what I dealt with wasn't as extreme as what somebody else dealt with. But trauma is really just a deeply distressing or disturbing event that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope. For, you know, for me, for example, I may undergo something that may not be traumatic to me, but to somebody else, it could be highly traumatic. And so um, there's lots of different variations of this. And it's just important to note that everybody's different. And, and that's why it's important that we, we listen to each other and, and understand where, where we're coming from. Um, there's several different types of, of traumatic events or kind of if we put it in categories. Uh, there's one-time events where something very extreme happens to you. There's an accident or an injury or a, you know, a violent attack or, or a severe car wreck, those kind of traumas. There's also um, ongoing relentless trauma or stress that's carried out over a long period of time. And so that might be something like you know, multiple traumas. Some people have gone through so many traumas that if you ask them what is the defining trauma in your life, they can't really explain it because to them, it's all just kind of mushed together. And so ongoing stress can uh, can be an ongoing trauma. And then other commonly overlooked things might be things like for a child, like a major surgery, young, when a child's very young, uh, sudden death of a, a really close loved one, uh, a breakup of a significant relationship. The other thing we notice with trauma is that, that the more traumatic experiences you have at a young age, the the bigger the impact that future stress has on you. So people who, you know, have relatively kind of, you know, I don't want to say benign lives or things, everything went hunky dory and good, but just don't have those those extreme events in childhood and have safe loving family members, connections, meaningful connections with other people, when those people undergo stress, their brain reacts differently than somebody who has undergone a lot of stress over the course of their life. Meaning better or worse, it reacts more healthy or less healthy. And I, I asked that question because sometimes if you go through a lot, you learn how to handle a lot. And, and if you don't go through it, you don't know how to handle it versus, but also you may get pushed closer to the edge if you've gone through more. So which is it? Yeah. Yeah. And when I'm, th- when I'm talking about trauma, you know, we, we think about something really extreme, um, not just difficulties, but, but actual real traumas. Um, we find that the, the brain reacts worse. And, and what happens is, is that you come to anticipate that here it comes again you know, here's the next bad thing. Here's, here comes this other bad thing because your, your brain has sort of been preconditioned to expect a negative outcome. And so it, it, it's not that it's impossible. People do it all the time. And, uh, and that's the work that we do and what's exciting. But the, the problem is, is that your brain holds on to that. And then when the new stimuli comes, you're expecting the same thing to happen again. Can trauma just be something that's really sad and life altering that that happens to you that was unexpected? I guess that sounds like a really stupid question because that's that's probably part of what trauma is. But I think trauma is inherent with being a human, isn't it? I mean, are there people who get through life without trauma? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I wonder that all the time. You know, I, I don't know. I, I think that probably everybody at some point in their life goes through something really difficult, goes through something traumatic, right? But the difference is, is it something that overwhelms your ability to cope to the point that you actually shut down? And, and so when you think of um, something like, let's say you, you got in a violent attack and somebody attacked you, pushed you in a corner, physically assaulted you, and there was no escape. When there's no escape, your brain shuts down. And you may have you know kind of heard this term before, but 
you know, we talk about when people kind of seem like they're outside of their body or they're not, they're not present in their mind. It's, it's a protective instinct that we go to, you know, we go to another place and you'll hear those stories from people who've gone through a lot of trauma where they just weren't there anymore. And then their ability to recall what happened to them is really limited. Um, and so that's, you know, when we think of trauma, we're, we're talking about really intense things. Now, um, difficulties, challenges, bad things are, are different than something truly deeply traumatic. What are some of the misconceptions about trauma then? Things that we might believe about it that aren't, aren't actually true. I think that there's a misconception that, tr- that trauma is a, a problem with memory. I think that that's a pretty common thing. Like in, it, years ago, when we think about PTSD and people coming back from the Vietnam War and er, our early conceptions of trauma really revolved around this idea of, you know, it's it's a faulty memory. You know, you, it, we just need to sort of help you process your memory about this event. But the reality is, is that when trauma gets lodged in your brain, it doesn't really just lodge in your brain. It gets connected into your body. And that's where it's complicated because it, it's where the 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 knowledge we have of the brain now is is much different than what we knew years and years ago because a lot because of the technology we have the ability now to map the brain in ways that we haven't been able to before and so we can see you know the images i've gone I've been in many trainings where you you can see you know the images and parts of the brain that literally what they say are offline like a certain por- portion of your brain is just not as active so people who've undergone trauma uh, their their prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of your brain, is is really not as engaged, and particularly under stress, those people struggle to th- stop and think. And um, you know, the front part of your brain, prefrontal cortex, is responsible for all it, being open to new ideas, solutions. It's your ability to rationalize things, to think things through. Well, when you have been traumatized your fight or flight response gets triggered. And that's a totally different part of your brain. So what happens is that other part of your brain becomes hyperactive. And, and that part of your brain, it's like a pattern. It keeps coming back up. But the pre- prefrontal cortex is not utilized as much when you're facing stress. And so it's that that's really the difference there. And when we think about why are we having these body reactions? Why are people who have undergone trauma have a much higher uh incidence of physical problems, uh, pain, uh, gastrointestinal issues, uh, concentration problems, lots of different issues. And those are all kind of tied to the way the brain has kind of been wired to handle that stress. Okay. So I heard you say that when the prefrontal cortex isn't working, that you're relying more, the more ten, the more trauma you've had, the more flight and flight or fight response you've got going on, the less the prefrontal cortex is working. But what? how does that transition into the physical problems? Like I, I get that your mind's not working on the same level that it, that it might be, but how, how does that translate into the body? Yeah, and, th- and this is where it gets complicated because um, there is a nerve, there, there's a vagal nerve that runs from the base of your brainstem And it runs down into your body and connects to all of your, to your organs, to your main parts of your body. And where it's really weird. And I I mean, I can't completely understand it myself because it's really fascinating, but um, your memories, the the things that get triggered in your body um, in different portions of your body are connected to those fight or flight responses. And so you can actually start having feelings of physical pain and sensations just because of a trigger of something you're triggered to that ties back to that trauma. So if I have a certain smell or a certain sound or a certain, you know, visual cue that actually connects me right back to that event. And some of the same sensations that I felt then I feel again in that very moment, I I can feel some of those same pain sensations. It's really fascinating how that works. So how do we see this when we've had trauma in our past coming up in our future relationships? So, and this, this might sound like an obvious 
question, but I think the discussion is important. Let's say you're sexually abused as a child, and then as you um, get into a healthy, let's say, marital relationship later, but it causes some kind of a, a stunted sexual relationship with your spouse. How how do they affect our? And that's just one example of many, obviously. But how do they? affect all of our future relationships if, if it's not dealt with? And and do some people deal with it naturally or does everybody need to get help in dealing with trauma? That's a great question. You know, it, some people do deal with it naturally and, and not everybody necessarily has to. This is where it's where I'm really encouraged by a lot of the research going on now. And we'll talk, we can talk a little bit later about things like um, neurofeedback. Um, they're finding, you know, yoga, exercise, all those kind of things are, are really important. And you know why? because they reconnect the body in positive ways with other people. Um, and, and when you get in a relationship and somebody touches you and you've been sexually abused before, depending on how they touch you or what the context is, there, there could be things that are triggered there that are outside that person's conscious awareness. So what happens is if, if I'm, say I'm a lady and my husband and I've been sexually abused and my husband touches me and I have a reaction the husband feels like it's his fault. Like, well, why are you, you know, what, what's going on here? Why can't I touch you? And, and the wife in that, in that situation is not thinking consciously anything negative towards her husband. She's having a body reaction, a trigger moment that's triggered all the way back to the trauma. And in a lot of cases, we find that they're not consciously aware of the connection. So what happens is it comes out in a fight, comes out in a frustration. Well, you know, I don't want to be intimate with you. Well, why not? You know, what is wrong with me? And then before you know it, it, it becomes this big fight. And in reality, the, the, the real main issue is the trauma underlying all of it. And sometimes people don't realize that until they start talking about it and processing it. Well, and I would suspect that that with how many cases there are, what is it like one in three women end up being sexually abused? Yes. Uh, we used to think that it was one in five, one in six. And, and by the most recent uh, studies there, yeah, it's, it's about one in three. So that's, wow. that, you know, that's a huge percentage of our population. Um, and that's not, that's just sexual abuse. We're not talking about other traumas either. I mean, that's just that one, that's just one portion of it. So um, I think one of the last trainings I was at, um, it was actually with uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who you mentioned a little earlier in the, in the quote. Um, but, you know, he's saying that they believe that upwards of 40 to potentially 50% of people have, have experienced a significant trauma in their life at some point. Well, and with the, with the, the sexual abuse being that high, that many women, I would suspect that it's a really important conversation to have this one that we're having here of being aware that if you're having difficulty in your relationship in your significant in your relationship with your significant other and you have that in your past that that would be a first place to look to start to deal with that trauma so that you can get past it and have a healthy relationship that's right yes. and a lot of people a lot of people are you know they're really when they hear that though it's it's really it can be intimidating because it's like well, wait a minute, in order for me to be happy, I have to go back and I have to talk about all this terrible stuff that happened to me. And I think that's another misconception, you know, that I think is important for us to discuss. So you don't go back and process the trauma to relive it. So like when I'm in therapy with people, I don't have them tell me all of the details so they can, you know, reprocess their trauma. What, the reason we talk about the details is so we can figure out what all was in their environment at the time of the trauma, so we can identify the triggers. The triggers are the key. We need to know what those triggers are. And without talking about and figuring out what all was, you know, so we, you know, I ask a lot of questions about well, what was around you, not, not what the person was necessarily doing exactly, but, you know, where were you? Uh, what day was it? Do you know? What time of year was it? What were you in the city? Were you in the country? Were you, all those kind of things matter because those are giving giving us ideas on where the triggers likely are. And a lot of times people find out they have triggers that they didn't even know about. And once they find out their triggers, it gives them a sense of power because now I have some control. I have some control on how I can respond to it versus when you don't, you know, when you just get really upset and cry or angry or scared and you don't know where it comes from, that's a really scary feeling because you feel like you're no longer in control of your own body. 
And that's what we want to give people back is we want to give people back control of themselves. So once you find these triggers, do you see a high level of success in people being able to overcome? Yes. Yeah. If when, when people identify those triggers and we, and we, you know, there's a lot of different ways to handle them. Um, you know, there's several different approaches, but I, I like to take a um, sort of a, a soft exposure approach. And what I mean by that is we're not going to take somebody and go throw them out in the middle of what they're scared to death of right away. But what we're going to do is we're going to take baby steps. We're going to take little bitty baby steps. Just, you know, the tortoise and the hare is one of the, sometimes I have people read that book. I mean, that sounds silly, but we really focus on that idea of, hey, we're going to go about this really slow, really gradually. And what happens is, is when, let's say, for example, um, somebody is scared of a park because they had a bad encounter at a park or were abused or raped at a park. And now all of a sudden, any park, it's like, I can't go near it. Well, in the beginning, we may not have them go and go immediately and walk out in the park. What we would do is we might send them with somebody who they really feel safe with. And we might have them drive to the park and not even get out of their car. We might have them sit in the car and just talk to their friend while they're at that park and then leave. Maybe maybe they go for 10 minutes and maybe the next time they go for 15 or 20. Maybe the next time they get out and they just stand by the park for maybe five or 10 minutes. And that, that gradual process, what happens in the brain is the brain learns and realizes, hey, I'm okay. I'm okay. This is not happening again. This happened in the past. Right now in the future, I'm safe. And the number one thing to start with uh, in any treatment with trauma is, is the feeling of safety. If Because the reason people are so you know, hypervigilant is because their, their internal alarm system has been hijacked, okay? Your internal alarm bells, which protect you, they're, they're the part of your, of your brain that is designed to identify threats and to escape or fight, right? Fight or flight to get out of it. And so that part of your brain has been overworked and kind of rewired a different way. And so now we, want, we need to alter that. I was going to say, how do people know if they need help? But of course, you're going to know if you need help, if you're not functioning well, right? There Um, there it is. You just said it. You just said it right there. The way you know you need help is when your daily life has been affected. Okay. So for example, what if I've been traumatized and I'm completely safe, happy in every environment, but I can't go to parks? Well, you know what? If I'm happy everywhere else and and I'm doing well everywhere else, I can, I can avoid a park. Right. But what happens when it's not just a park? What happens when it's, you know, walking down the street? What happens when it's going to the grocery store? What happens when it's going to a meeting or having to give a presentation or those kind of things? So now when it begins to impact your daily life and I'm no longer able to do the things that I need to do for myself that are good, I know that I need to address that. You do marital counseling privately. What are the spaces that you see trauma and marriage overlapping? A lot in, um, usually one of the first places we see it is in in intimacy. So physical intimacy uh, is a big one. Um, It overlaps a lot there where people just aren't being physically intimate with each other anymore. There, you know, there's traumas, there's triggers there. Uh, we, We see it about when we think about control. So some people, after trauma become very controlling because they weren't able to control what happened to them. So it becomes a coping mechanism to control things around us. So sometimes people can be very OCD or very compulsive that can cause problems in relationships where the, you know, their partner feels like, Hey, you're just, you're trying to control me, but you know, this isn't working. Um, That's another common one. What should people do who have experienced trauma and they want to start down this, this path to recovery. I, mean, I think the first, the first thing is, is developing a developing as best you can positive relationships with people that you trust. And I know that's a really kind of tough thing to say when, when people have undergone trauma and they see everything as, as, as a threat, because what happens is people get in a rut, right? It's like they, they don't trust. And when you don't trust people and you're, um, you're hypervigilant about everything, we tend to not be the easiest people to be around. 
you know? And so then people get, people don't want to be around them. Well, then they interpret that as nobody likes me. And here we go on this hamster wheel over and over. So it, it's really sometimes kind of hard to be break out of it, but, but the first step is, is seeking that help, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, a friend that you trust to talk to, or you're a therapist, a uh, pastor, but, but we, we heal. I, I've heard this said several times before, and I really like it. I don't remember where I heard it. I've heard it from friends and, and all over the place, but people tend to be hurt in the context of relationship. So it only makes sense that we tend to heal in the context of relationship as well. So it's really important. And when you're, when you're isolated and alone, um, it's really hard to get better. I like that. Heal in the context of relationship. Thank you. Okay. As we come to the end of the show today, do you have any final ideas or thoughts about this whole thing that you want to discuss or bring up? You know, I just, I just encourage people and say that a lot of people deal with trauma in in different ways. And I think one of the, particularly as we're coming out of this COVID world, you know, and I say coming out of, we're kind of still in it, you know, I mean, we're still struggling with this as a society. And I think that, that we're going to, I think that it's super important that we don't lose um, the importance of relationships, the importance of connecting with other people. It's such a foundational thing. It does. It's so good for the brain and the body. And, and how do we do that? You know, people ask those questions. Well, what if I don't get along with people or what, you know, what if, what if I have these challenges? And I think that just breaking out of those patterns and finding ways to have positive relationships and start slowly. Um, I think one caution I would say to people would be, you know, it doesn't mean going out there and trusting everybody either, because that's another side of trauma too. Sometimes that people go down is sort of like headlong throwing themselves into every relationship. And so I think that, you know, being wise and smart and, and slowly developing relationships with people around us that, that we're, you know, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's people that we can be friendly and nice to that reciprocal back and forth is, um, is just huge. And I hope that we um, get back to that in our society and, you know, hopefully we can do more things in person as, as we move forward. Yes. Thank you for being here with us today. I know that you are busy and that you're very selective about taking on clients, but if people wanted to get in touch with you, um, where can they find you? The easiest way to find me is, is just through my email and that's uh, trevor.lay.5 at gmail.com. I'm super responsive on there and I can plug people in and get people set up um, with sessions. Um, I do try to be selective in, in, in who I take uh, just to keep I, I try to keep a good, healthy work-life balance with my family, but I also really, really love helping people. And when people are, are passionate about wanting help, I just have a hard time turning people down that want to get help. So, um, so if people need to reach out to me, please feel free to do that and I'll be happy to help. You're a good man. And his email address will be in the show notes on the website. So www.loveyourstorypodcast.com on this episode. And Trevor, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Lori. Appreciate you having me. I'll close with a quote from Michelle Rosenthal. She said, trauma creates change you don't choose. Healing is about creating change you do choose. Unquote. Thank you for being here today. Please share this episode link with someone who has suffered from trauma so that we can help Keep living your best life story on purpose. And I sure appreciate hearing from you listeners. Hop on the website, loveyourstorypodcast.com and you can leave comments or we can hear from you through reviews on your podcast app also. Thanks for being here. Share the love and we'll see you in two weeks.